uh, John Madden. Uh, I'm from Smithfield Feedlot in uh, the eastern slopes of South East Queensland. We're a, uh, we're a feedlot with a uh, capacity of around 20,000 head of cattle. Uh, we turn those cattle about three times a year, so we turn out about 60,000 head of cattle a year. It requires us to purchase about 50,000 tonnes of grain on an annual basis, and we would inject about $2 million annually uh, in direct wages into our small community of less than 300 people. So it's a family business. Uh, it's been going about 20 years. Uh, it's family owned and family operated. Uh, it's quite distinct from a lot of the uh, large uh, feedlot operations in Australia, which are mostly corporate owned. Uh, we always felt that gave us a bit of a strategic advantage. Um, we've always been very quick to adapt to any new technologies. Um, we can make decisions quickly and we've just got that skin in the game to make a lot of things work. So, uh, we, we've always had a motto also of wanting to be the second to try a good idea, not necessarily the first. That's uh, how uh, capital often allows us not to make too many mistakes. Now, feedlots uh, in Australia uh, have evolved uh, from a point of view of being able to consistently uh, supply, uh, do the supply chain. Uh, the continuity of that supply in Australia is often interrupted by periods of drought uh, where our large low cost pasture systems based on rangeland production uh, are often interrupted by those events. Uh, so we uh, we're able to uh, utilise large ruminants uh, in an effective manner to extract nutrient from our vast rangelands. Uh, when those animals reach their mature frame, uh, they're often uh, the cost of uh, finishing them to their endpoint specification uh, requires more energy, and our uh, often low profile uh, rangeland struggle to do this, especially in times of stress. So we do this by providing a facility uh, to uh, feed cattle high energy diets. Uh, our domestic trade cattle usually fed for 70 days and. Uh, our mid-range uh, uh, export ops to the North Asian market are uh, around 100 to 120 days on feed. <coughs> now, we've, uh, we rely on maintaining maximum, uh, our maximum capacity. Uh, we need to, uh, to have a low margin, full occupancy model to achieve any sort of returns on our capital. But to do this, we need to maintain uh, efficiency gains. Now, running a feedlot is a little bit like flying a 747 jet. Uh, the cattle are really our passengers, our, uh, our managers sit in the flight deck, uh, and our livestock crew uh, get the cattle off and on and uh, make sure they've got pretzels and beer. But the, uh, the thing that really keeps the thing flying is your feeding system and your milling system. That feed production system provides those nutrients to the cattle. If that doesn't work, you're going to plummet to earth very quickly and everybody's going to scream and start crying because we're all going to die. <laughs> the, so at any one time, you have anything up to 25 to $30 million worth of livestock on this place and uh, you can't have a bad day. It's got to work every day, 365 days a year. So how, uh, how feedlots have affected the... Uh, the, the productivity of the beef industry over the last 40 years in the United States uh, is a good example of, as the maturity of the industry has probably reached its point. Uh, the red line at the bottom is the uh, cattle population in the United States. As you can see, that is declining. Uh, many of their range lands have been taken up with anything from uh, hunting to uh, conservation. Uh, so it's reduced their capacity to run the same size herds. But as you can see in the green line, their meat production has continued to rise over that time. And that's been made possible by the innovations. Innovations, good supply chain management systems. So our feedlot is basically an energy transfer system. We, we have our inputs, we have our grain and our co-products and our fuel. Uh, the grain and co-products being the major uh, energy input, uh, 
in say using our model the 20,000 head feedlot it'd be about 14 to 15 million dollars worth of those uh, energy inputs uh, per annum and to a lesser extent our fuel inputs which are around half a million dollars the the tr the uh, the transfer system uh, revolves around the processing of our grains, preparations of, uh, of our rations, our cattle performance and our feeding system. And our outputs are our carcass of course and we've got another output and that's our manure. So the grain uh, when it comes in what we do is we run a steam flaking process uh, we put in these st three steam flakers about 10 years ago, 10 to 11 years ago. Uh, be previous to that, we were running a tempered grain system. The steam flaking process, especially where, where we are in Queensland, enables us to utilise sorghum. Uh, now, sorghum has a certain percentage of uh, undigestible starch in it. Uh, and uh, the energy input into that uh, we, under the steam flaking process where we cook it and flake it to a very fine matter uh, can give us about a 15% energy kick of the value of that grain. Uh, this costs us about 8 to $10 a tonne in fuel costs. We run a uh, 200 horsepower uh, or 2 megawatt uh, diesel fired boiler to generate our steam. So for an 8 to $10, eight to ten dollar investment uh, at sorghum at say $220 a tonne, uh, we can get uh, anything up to $25 free kick. So uh, as far as a investment in, in, uh, in infrastructure goes, this is the thing that returns our biggest return in the whole feedlot. Uh, to uh, hormone growth in plants, to ionophores, fullers, and many other things that we've, we've been able to implement over the last 20 years to help that uh, that energy transfer efficiency. So, of course, I mentioned before about our eight outputs, of course, the carcass, but we've got another output, and that's the manure and lots of it. Now, this manure is traditionally be used as a fertilizer. We, uh, we basically set the price of uh, whatever the demand to try and get rid of it. We, uh, we break it down uh, to a certain stage where the manure spreaders can utilize it. Uh, during this process, it releases a lot of its energy in the form of uh, carbon dioxide or methane. But I'll get back to that later. So we've uh, we've talked about it. Uh, our energy inputs, uh, grain and fuel, and our energy outputs, which is a carcass and manure. So my study project was looking at trying to utilise one of one of those outputs, our manure, and using it as an energy input as a fuel in the steam flaking process. So the whole concept is about creating an energy loop system. Uh, our fuel, uh, fuel bill for doing that feed processing at about half a million dollars a year uh, could be solved by using our own manure. So it's a self-replenishing renewable fuel uh, for an on-site energy use uh, with some environmental advantages attached. So, how do we extract the energy from the manure? There's, uh, basically what I've learned over the time is there's, there's two ways of looking at it. Uh, aerobic digestion and gasification. Uh, the conventional wisdom will tell you that gasification is used for dry manure products and anaerobic digestion is used for wet manure products. Uh, so, the traditional uh, anaerobic digestion processes probably weren't suitable. Uh, I've learned of a dry fermentation process, uh, a system developed by Beacon in Germany. So talking to them over there, uh, this uh, is a fairly high capital cost project. Uh, really still needs about 50% uh, dry matter product is about as much as an handle and manure is around 80% dry matter <coughs> usually. So, uh, these systems, and this one would be the closest you could get to using our aerobic process effectively for feed yard manure. The gasifiers, uh, plenty of these on the market being developed in America. Um, well, they're actually, this one we're looking at here is being uh, sold by Wichita Burner. It's actually uh, made in Italy. 
uh, very cheap units. Uh, you can set one of these up for about 300,000 US. Uh, it has some limitations uh, though when it comes to feedlot manure because of feedlot manure's high ash content. It's a very coarse fuel. Uh, it contains lots of nasties because of the pen surfaces are usually compounded dirt. Uh, during the cleaning process and collection of that manure, we pick up a lot of dirt and ash. And if you throw dirt on fire, which these things are, you'll put it out. Uh, a lot of the biomass gasifiers in the states that are underground using uh, agricultural residues. Uh, horse manure is very good through them. Chicken litter can be uh, used very well to produce energy, um, but still. Not very well suited for the feedlot situation, although the manager there, Dave Daniel, still believes that if we can maintain the integrity of the feedlot manure few through good uh, pen management strategies, uh, they are still capable of producing a good energy, a good steam production from these. Still believes that most, of, most feedlots will be doing this in two years. Then I went to Greeley in Colorado. Uh, to Harsh Industries, um, been an interesting project. They've joined forces with uh, JBS Five Rivers Feedlot at Kersley, a massive feedlot, about 100,000 head they feed there. Uh, they're very constrained environmentally as far as how they dispose of their manure. And uh, there was a hot heath concept created uh, in uh, during the BSE uh, outbreak in England. A, a Canadian called Dave Brooks, who had a history in chromology where he used to burn human bodies, was given the task of getting rid of all those BSE cattle in England. And uh, he created a continuous flow gasifier with a reburn incineration system that uh, he found he could turn the pro propane off after about seven days and the thing self-perpetuated. So using that technology, which is painted these guys are building a Pacific machine designed to gasify feedlot manure and turn it to steam. The unit you're looking at there is the first commercial unit they're, uh, they're making. I was looking at that in January. Uh, they've completed it. They, they ran it at the feedlot uh, a couple of months ago uh, and it broke down, which of course it would on the first go. So uh, it's still a work in progress, but uh, the guys up there are very excited about this project. Uh, it's got a lot of potential in that area. Uh, but the general theme I found over there is being driven by the con uh, environmental concerns uh, from those large feedlots, feedlots uh, in disposing of their manure. I went to uh, Amarillo uh, to visit the AgriLife guys. Um, uh, Dr. John Sweetham and Brett Averman have been doing a lot of research on how to extract energy from manure uh, over the years. They had a large project a few years ago with a company called Panda Energy, which was going to use feedlot manure in Amarillo area to fire their ethanol plant uh, for steam production. Uh, that company since went broke and, uh, and most of the research has been able to carry on to fruition. Uh, but however, they were very positive about the, the, uh, the use of feedlot manure in a reburn situation. Uh, the, uh, the general work they've been doing now uh, at this area is to do with the uh, particulate matter uh, pollution in the Amarillo area. A lot of feed yards are very constrained now uh, because of the dropping of the water table in that area. Uh, uh, the traditional method of getting rid of manure was to spread it uh, on fields for growing crops and absorbing that nutrient. Uh, but because the irrigation uh, cropping systems in the area are starting to uh, shut down, they cannot get rid of that manure. They clean their pens about once a year. It's a 17 inch rainfall and it's a heck of a lot of dust to deal with. Uh, but uh, after talking to all these uh, people and uh, the problems they're having, uh, I just thought it was a no-brainer that uh, some of these systems should be in feedlots, which I didn't see. So I had to ask the question, why? And that involved talking to the feed yards. And I'll just give you an idea of some of the quotes that uh, I was told. Uh, uh, Ken Winters from uh, Dodge City uh, has a feedlot right on the edge of town. Uh, naturally thought there'd be a lot of problems there. 
but his attitude uh, tended to be very conservative and, and uh, I won't put on an American accent, but it was something along the lines of some things are just meant to be thrown on the ground, son. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Burnett from crack feeders in, in Oklahoma said uh, he had more important things to worry about than running a good effective yard. Ken Smith from NSA Colorado, uh, he said he's seen renewable projects in the 70s come and go. Um, and uh, most people are very sceptical about any sort of energy crisis. Tom Fanning from Buffalo Feeders in Lane County, uh, just not willing to increase fixed capital costs in a feed yard, suffering from very fine margins. And Lad Lafferty of Wheeler Brothers Feed Lot at Watonga said people are just going around chasing government funding and trying to push their own agendas. So, uh, <laughs> It sort of left me uh, a little bit estranged, um, but uh, through the Texas Pan Handle, where, where some areas uh, like uh, Dalhart and Hereford would have a million head of cattle in feed in some very small radius, it's less than 50 uh, kilometres radius, um, the feed, getting rid of their feedlot manure has become quite a challenge and a cost for their businesses, and the environmental concerns are really starting to close in on them. And I think uh, companies like Harsh are really seeing the opportunities that may arise there. The meat industry in America, just digressing away from my subject, but you, I tend to want to have a look at the bigger picture at times. I talked to Greg Dowd from the National Cattlemen's Association over there. Uh, basically, he's saying that feedlot capacity in the US is 15% overcapacitized and 15% overcapacitized in their processing. Uh, industry as well. The US herd is shrinking. However, with the devaluing of the American dollar, the exports have shot up there this year. Um, they've taken a lot of Australia's share of the North Asian market, uh, and this is going to chew significantly into their national herd. It takes about three year lag on supply, and we will not see them be able to meet demand after that time. So maybe good times ahead for us. <coughs> Uh, his, his take on uh, the future of the feedlot business, uh, particularly as a, a growing uh, natural and, uh, and organic uh, beef trade, um, uh, was uh, more or less that you run a high volume, low margin business or a low volume, high margin business, take your pick. Uh, while also in Washington, uh, James Murphy, a trade representative of the US government and coordinates all trading policy for the EU, uh, was, uh, was put it succinctly when he said uh, the EU were kinophobes and the US microphobes, uh, especially dealing in issues like uh, market access to, you, uh, to the EU uh, after uh, they continue to uh, stonewall on HEP treated beef after the WAT ruling overruled them. Um, he is worried about the abandonment of science and the decision-making process as the next great dark age. I visited Greg Pankhurst Speedlot in Indonesia. Um, it was a uh, fantastic system to have a look at uh, his uh, feedlot. Uh, he feeds about 10,000 head in this one uh, in southern Sumatra. Uh, uh, quite amazing concept when you look at his rainfall fall is three and a half a year. That's three and a half metres of rain. So he runs a stocking density of about two head per square metre, unlike the Australian stocking density in a feed yard would be about twelve and a half. So it's all under cover, pays pens, uses coconut husks as a bedding, um, and cleans them out every three days. So we looked at high value manure. Uh, that would be about the best you'd see in the world. Uh, he was investigating the use of using it as a renewable energy source to power the feedlot, which has no power at site, um, but he simply gets paid too much as a fertiliser. Uh, Elders Feedlot, um, uh, Woody Man Safari, who runs the Elders Feedlot, uh, 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 4,500 yard, uh, runs their sterling beef program where they're trying to upgrade the slaughtering practices uh, by having a more professional feedlot. Uh, uh, and on the left hand side there you'll see uh, some of the local production there which is done uh, 
uh, by uh, leasing out the uh, pregnant heifers when they arrive, letting them calve and giving those calves to the locals to raise. While in uh, Indonesia we're looking at uh, the native Indonesian livestock uh, versus the Australian imported steer, uh, not being fair to them, the beef on the right had a few more days on feed, uh, but a lot of those feed lots are required by government to add a certain percentage of domestic stock in them. Many other things I saw in Indonesia, different uh, production system, a, uh, Henry Wijara who uh, ran a hundred uh, hectares of prawn uh, ponds uh, and he also ran these birds nest sheds where he runs sparrows and collect the saliva from the nests as the sparrows make them and sells it to the Chinese. He makes about $3,000 a month out of one of those sheds and he's got plenty of them. Hong Kong gave me an insight into the aspirational change with the Chinese. Hong Kong reproduction has gone from about 14 kilos per annum to about 27 kilos per annum in, uh, in five years. Uh, the Chinese uh, consumption, although hard to measure, has stayed stagnant over the last five years, but uh, the numbers coming out of Hong Kong tells us uh, a preference for the red meats uh, as they increase their wealth. Bahrain is interesting. Uh, nice little Afghani steer on the left, uh, versus the Australian <laughs> beef on the right. Uh, and the French obsession with integrity of product where they sell a photo of the baby before he grows up and hangs on the hook, which is quite unique. India, uh, yeah, 200 head of, uh, of uh, cows in India, 100 head of buff uh, so 200 million head of cows and 100 million head of buffalo. Put that in perspective, Australia's total cattle population is around 25 to 26 million. So they don't eat any of them, where's it going to go? Probably a concern for the future as far as the box beef trade. They could develop uh, in disposing of spec, particularly the buffalo. Uh, and, uh, and the FMD risk they'll bring to South Asia and particularly to Australia. So in conclusion, uh, I, uh, I think that grain is now permanently linked to the energy market. Uh, Doing a energy to uh, to uh, a renewable energy system uh, as an offset to higher energy costs is going to be diminished somewhat by the higher increase in grain costs. Uh, they seem to be linked. Uh, hydrocarbons are everywhere. It's the cost of extractions that really need to be of value, and the renewables are viable if used at the point of production. Uh, technologies to utilise manure need to be specific to the industry and commercial and development will be driven by environmental restrictions, not energy costs. I'd like to thank my fellow travellers um, who, uh, who made life easy for us. Um, we are a small group, very mobile, and uh, it just made it so easy and uh, I've learned so much off them. My sponsor, Rabobank, uh, for giving me this opportunity and uh, I promise Susan how I'll try not to send her large emails of about three megabytes because I don't know how to reduce my photo size. <laughs> and most of all, my family who, uh, who uh, shared a little in my journey. Um, they were uh, tremendous, uh, allowed me to do this, uh, uh, shared a little bit of the journey with me and uh, I'll, I'll always remember it, hopefully.